Hello, everyone. I'm Meg Ropsel, creator of the exhibitions at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. And welcome to today's program featuring the Quarantine Public Library. I'm glad you're with us for a special presentation by Tracy Hahn and Katie Garth that accompanies the exhibition, Drawing Us Together, Public Life and Public Health in Contemporary Comics, now on view through December 17th. Today, you'll learn about the Quarantine Public Library, a collaboration between Tracy and Katie and dozens of other artists, writers, poets, and scholars. The collection unites one sheet, eight page books by contributors, making them available to download and print at home. The site feature, features tutorials to aid artists and non-artists alike in assembling these handheld books while sheltering in place and providing access to sh free shared tangible art. In 2020, print historian Stephen Heller called QPL's first contributions, books as first responders. The project had been featured in Forbes and Poets and Writers, among others, and is considered a digital media resource by the Center for Book Arts. Selections from the library are also included in the current exhibition at Radcliffe. Soon, you'll hear from Katie Garth, who is a print-based artist in Philadelphia, where she's currently visiting assistant professor of printmaking at Sarah Lawrence College and teaches at several Philadelphia area universities. Her interdisciplinary work explores tedium as a coping mechanism for uncertainty and often reflects her interests in language and independent publication. She received her MFA in printmaking from the Tyler School of Art and BFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she was Tracy's printing assistant at the Silver Buckle Press. She has exhibited internationally and her work has appeared in the Washington Post and print magazine. Tracy Hahn is a printing history educator, curator, and letterpress printer living in Madison, Wisconsin. She is senior artist emeritus from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she directed the Silver Buckle Press, a working museum of letterpress printing. Tracy oversaw the transfer of the press's collection to Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum in 2016, where she is now the president of the board of directors. In 2020, she co-curated Speaking of Books, Oral Histories from UW-Madison at the Chazen Museum of Art. That exhibition featured artist books from the Kohler Art Library with audio excerpts conducted by UW Archives Oral History Program with book arts alum and instructors. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Katie Garth and Tracy Hahn. Tracy, I'm going to interrupt you to say that you're muted. <laughs> I, I love that that's happening on Zoom because it's the classic cliche mistake to make. <laughs> Good morning to you all. Thank you to my collaborator, Katie. I'm Tracy Hahn. I'm coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Meg, for the introduction and to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute for having us. Um, and I'm Katie Garth, and I'm here in Philadelphia. I do live in Center City, so I hope that you won't hear too much Philadelphia noise, but we're really grateful to have QPL work included in drawing us together and excited to be here to talk with you. Quarantine Public Library is a repository of books made by artists, which we established in July 2020. The works we publish are for anyone to freely download, print, and publish, to assemble, to keep or give away. With more than 200 books in our collection, we have excitedly shared a simple on-demand artist book format with visitors from around the world at a time when in-person art experiences were hard to come by. The project has provided scaffolding for our creative output and professional exchange, sustaining our hearts and minds in a moment often marked by a casual disregard for humanity. We can't imagine having experienced the pandemic without the sustenance it has provided. Our friendship began in 2011 at UW-Madison, when I worked for the Silver Buckle Press, of which Tracy was the director. Tracy had long envisioned an exhibition of one-sheet, print-on-demand, eight-page books. The format's potential to unite work by very different kinds of artists was clear, and so was its capacity for encouraging engagement with book arts. When children visited the press, Tracy sometimes used a one-sheet book demonstration to grab their attention. To fresh eyes, the end result is inscrutable, but its construction provokes a sense of both the magical and the inevitable. 
to learn this form is to want to teach it to someone else. America's initial COVID-19 lockdowns commenced during my final semester of graduate school at the Tyler School of Art here in Philadelphia. Tracy had just celebrated the opening of Speaking of Book Arts, an exhibit she co-curated with Lynn Karenik at the Chazen Museum of Art in Madison. We were each nestled in our own hubs of knowledge and artistic expression, surrounded by beloved libraries, print and bookmaking facilities, and the others who frequented them until suddenly we weren't. As galleries, bookstores, universities, and museums shuttered, looking at art with other people, let alone handling it, seemed like a distant fantasy. Thesis shows, art fairs, and professional conferences moved online, and at some point we realized that Tracy's dream exhibit could too. It felt particularly potent to provide a physical book object to others sheltering in place, separated from both public institutions and their personal communities. So we decided to begin work upon my graduation. At the time, we wondered if delaying the project until May 2020 would mean the launch of an irrelevant project in a post-COVID world. In reality, we watched with alarm as an impotent government squandered opportunities to intervene in the service of public health. And then with horror, as law enforcement brazenly exercised its legacy of brutality against Black Americans like George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, and Breonna Taylor. All of those circumstances changed what it meant to ask for attention in online spaces which were suddenly and importantly flooded with anti-racism resources and protest strategies, in addition to health advisories. So we decided the site should direct donations to a relevant cause, and we realized that information equity was an obvious choice. We researched organizations and found Everyone On, which works to eliminate the digital divide by delivering free and affordable technology and training to underserved communities. We also worked on a pocket protest guide containing information about constitutional rights at organized demonstrations. Our launch was buoyed by a positive reception. A generous group of artists had quickly created thoughtful, energizing work in response to our invitation, and they excitedly shared the library with their own networks. QPL appeared on news websites in the US, India, and Australia, and had more than 2,000 unique visitors from 44 countries on the site's first day alone. Friends, family, and strangers shared footage of themselves printing and making books, and our dream had become real, so at some point we decided to continue adding to it. Katie and I weren't in search of a collaboration, though we knew that was something we wanted to do together someday. Instead, the idea for, for a quarantine public library simply emerged from phone conversations between friends, as we were each trying to cope with sheltering in place. As we talked QPL into being, its potential for good was a source of encouragement that gave us purpose impulse to make something to give to others during an awful time and around a stunning experience felt powerful, comforting, and right. Public libraries, and more generally formal education and teaching, were institutional service models that represented the kind of democratic principles we wanted QPL to embody. The project's name, which Katie suggested early on, was critical to our success. It perfectly captured the spirit of our idea and gave us the conceptual hook we needed to make a possibly confounding idea gettable. And like a public library, the site would be open to anyone who visited and it would offer a variety of books for free circulation. The bonus of our artist book library concept was that visitors could keep any book or as many as they wanted by printing and assembling at home. In a world temporarily without public commons, we use the familiar idea of libraries for a virtually shared space of brief refuge. QPL was intentionally designed with a balance of open and closed systems. There were clear boundaries like the format that we controlled but within those parameters, there was autonomy for free expression. 
we ask artists to follow strict submission guidelines, but beyond those rules, we trusted the authority of artists to make the books they wanted to share. The website was designed for ease of access and understanding. We cultivated an attitude of respect and kindness towards contributors and users. Design, design decisions were driven by utility and as much as possible, we streamlined our own processes. We worked pretty quickly to build the site as contributors were simultaneously creating its content, the books. Adding books in later rounds was made easier because we'd anticipated that QPL might grow. Though public libraries represented our service model, QPL is more accurately described as a publishing project. As publishers, we solicited content and formatted to our standards. We controlled presentation, distribution, and primary promotion of the work. Getting QPL established and running was in large part an editorial process, deciding on formats, drafting invitations for participants, writing and proofreading site copy, and figuring out the best pacing for external and internal schedules and deadlines. The work required us to be exacting and precise, things that we value. All of these activities are standard publishing as well as curatorial practices. If we think of our work as publishing, it allowed us to improvise our own structure for generation. Other ventures, like the Library of Artistic Print on Demand, have centralized disparate projects from myriad artists. And several printable zine websites also exist that accept and display all user submissions. The College Book Art Association has an excellent traveling zine exhibition and archive called Rising Together. And the discipline continues to practice its long established tradition of curated exchanges. Over the last decade, also art for a cause auctions and gallery shows have proliferated. None of these models entirely mirror our approach. Our similar personalities and mutual understanding allowed us to shrug off parameters we didn't want and to embrace the guardrails that felt right. Our familiarity with artist books book arts exhibitions, and our own separate practices and curatorial work informed QPL. A presentation of book arts per se was not the goal as much as artist books were the means. We used familiar tools to put something meaningful and tangible in people's hands at a bewildering time. The idea of offering free artist books for home printing was made possible because of the eight page book structure we used. Book artists recognize the form's value as a basic teaching tool. It's easy to make and has surprising power to inscribe pleasure. The structure's economy of means, carrying content on only one side of a sheet of paper, allowed us to present artist books on a website with elegance and efficiency. Unlike the folio, the simplest codex form, this one sheet structure yields a multi-page book that supports nuanced expression of many essential book arts concerns. Eight pages allow sufficient room for elaboration of content, exploration of sequencing, and you can see by the protean nature of this form, how it's reflected in the books housed in the library. One thing that we discussed is how very broadly the form is used in the world. It's most familiar to zinesters and to many makers who do not think of their work in the context of book arts at all. This speaks to the strength of the form rather than to a failure of classification. And it's an excellent reminder that people make books for all kinds of reasons. The site launched with books from 43 separate artists, most of whom we know personally. This intimacy created a sense of community that so many of us were lacking. It was also useful to have a rapport with artists from whom we solicited unpaid work, though, of course, our labor was also gratis. Each of us created separate rosters of 30 artists to invite, and we agreed to publish the work of anyone who said yes. 
Our lists contained a range of artists who we believed would showcase the exceptional adaptability of this book format. And we checked on one another's indices only to avoid inviting the same artist twice. This very autonomous aspect of our collaboration was enabled by mutual trust an understanding of each other's working styles and extensive discussions about the range of characteristics we hoped to represent. We replicated this balance in the invitations to those first artists. That correspondence read, we expect the books to be loose, but you can be as tight as you want. Books can be visual and or textual, silly, sad, or funny. We're looking for work that's juicy and arresting. That's why we're inviting you. At the time, we provided just two weeks, hoping to encourage playfulness and eliminate the second guessing and anxiety often invoked by premeditation. We asked artists, some emerging, some established, and a few amateur, who employed a variety of media sensibilities and visual styles with attention to representation across gender and sexuality, race, age, ability, and status. We reached out to book artists, printmakers, graphic designers, illustrators, fine artists, poets, photographers, writers, and some who didn't self-identify as artists at all. We included work that might not have suited our own tastes and preferences, which was made easier by the independence that our separate selection processes afforded. An invitation to Tia Blassingame resulted in a collaboration with her own initiative, the Book Print Artist Scholar of Color Collective. We also cold emailed prominent artists we admired and were thrilled when they agreed to participate. Some artists wrote to ask for our consideration. For our December 2021 international release, we used referrals from colleagues to invite artists, but we also hunted down contributors who were complete strangers, often sending an invitation to an email address discovered on an obscure and perhaps outdated website dubious it would reach them at all and amazed when they wrote back to join in. Being in touch with this chorus of participants has radically changed our perceptions of creative community, and we see this reflected in the collection itself. We considered the ways in which an invitation-only collection that relied largely on our own networks might reproduce aspects of gatekeeping that were in conflict with our ideals. The time and care we devoted to publishing each book was integral to the project's success. And we knew that replicating that work across unlimited submissions was not realistic for two individuals. We also saw the accessibility and attractiveness of our collection as a byproduct of this significant forethought and felt its content should reflect our own standards and concerns. It had never been our ambition to have as many books as possible in the collection. We hope that future initiatives from other book artists will pursue outcomes that our collection might not embody. We love so, so many books in the library, really all of them, but we did choose a few to share with you today. This mini comic about an absent father was made by James Stern, a cartoonist and co-founder of the Center for Cartoon Studies, a college in Vermont. In the Car at Night is an excellent example of an artist using the format for a straight up sequence narrative. The book conveys the storytelling power of eight little pages. Using scale changes, shifting views, and exquisite pacing, James's book feels huge despite the ephemerality of everyday life that's depicted. This book slayed us. Translations from the Interior by Jenna Osman. The blurb for this book is, during quarantine, with the help of Google Translate, everyday household objects finally have their say. Series one features my tablecloth.
This writer also exploits the power of book sequencing, but in a non-narrative way. Osman is a poet who teaches in the MFA creative writing program at Temple University. And here she takes the interiority of quarantine, an artist staring at her tablecloth, cell phone in hand, as her starting point. Through close looking, she jumps focus to investigate how text is woven, tangled, and reimagined. Tiffany Barber's collaboration with artists Sandy Williams IV and Mariana Pariska plays on self-help literature and outlines steps towards shedding personal and cultural baggage to break up with white supremacy. Here, Barber's including reproductions of artworks by Williams and Pariska, and she uses them to compose a standalone artist book. It's a how-to on responding to white supremacy. Here, the book form functions as rhetoric and documentation. It elegantly uses the most fundamental elements of books, words, and images to instruct. It's a powerful handbook. This title is one of those we published in collaboration with the Book Print Artist Scholar of Color Collective, which brings scholars of book history and print culture into conversation and collaboration with Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, or BIPOC, book artists, papermakers, curators, letterpress printers, and printmakers to build community and support systems. I might have a time delay, but I'm going to pop into Alex Lucas's book. The blurb he wrote for this is variable message signs from March through June 2020. When we invited an artist to contribute to QPL, we made it clear that their book could be on or about anything and did not necessarily need to be about COVID-19. Still books that have particularly touched us are, are moving because they reference a rhyme with the shared experience of global pandemic, the very thing that motivated us to create QPL in the first place. Alex Lucas's book is an example of this. The title, released in September 2020, felt like a cri de cour, stay home. This last book we want to show you is by an artist named Carolyn Swizich. Um, and in recognition of the fact that we may have a slight timing delay, but also considering the brief time that we're able to spend with each of these titles to begin with, um, I will just remind you that they're all available for longer term viewing at quarantinepubliclibrary.com. There's a self-deprecating encouragement delivered by this artist who takes a, rick, a risk and reveals personal courage. About the book, Carolyn says, quote, the author reflects on missteps that kept her from fully realizing personal and professional ambitions, something we can all relate to. Quarantine Public Library is collaborative at heart. It begins with our working relationship partnership, 
extends to our contributors and includes our audience. We think of visitors to the site who download, print, and make a book as being in collaboration with us. They complete the cycle of bookmaking and all are valued participants. We live in different parts of the country, but it's been COVID-19 that both inspired and necessitated a collaboration at a distance. The first opportunity we had to talk about QPL in person was in October 2021 at the Las Vegas Book Festival, more than 15 months after its launch. Our work depended on the phone and email, and we have used Google Apps, Drive, Forms, and Gmail to organize files, house submissions, and manage correspondence. Collaboration is a much discussed practice within book arts. Common method has one person directing the separately made parts, writing, printing, binding, etc., while retaining authority as the producer. For QPL, we used a blended identity model of collaboration. We shared development of the concept and co-own the final product. With that said, there has been much division of labor in the production of QPL. To make the work wider, we separately manage similar tasks like issuing invitations, answering mail, writing, and proofreading. Katie's fluency with digital tools and social media meant she interacted more directly with the site. My experience managing institutional projects helped fine tune communication. In the end, we feel each are in the other's debt, which makes for a gracefully balanced collaboration. Web design and social media strategy were key aspects of our early discussions. How could we quickly convey the potential of this niche form to a general audience in a way that encouraged and engaged? A successful project would reach viewers beyond our own networks, teach them something new, convince at least some to make a physical object, and then to give a certain intimate attention to that offbeat media. Even more ideally, it would then incite them to share it with others. Marketing experts with large budgets and significant expertise might spend months crafting a digital campaign just to entice a small fraction of its target audience to open an email. So getting a stranger to make a book is a much bigger ask, especially for two people working against a quick deadline. To us, an elegant solution would obscure this intricate dance of user engagement and showcase artists' contributions both individually and as a collection. My background as a web designer was a useful starting point, given our discipline's reticence towards fleeting and unstable technologies. The stereotypical book arts philosophy is a far cry from Silicon Valley's move fast and break things credo, for good reason. Tracy imagined the digital delivery of books and I was excited to make it happen. I suggested we create our project with Squarespace, a popular template-based web builder, which in my view sets the industry standard for sophisticated usable design. That choice meant that the site had specific advantages baked in from the beginning. It was responsive, functioning well for both desktop and mobile viewers among other devices. It was engineered for search engine optimization, and it allowed us to manage our own content rather than relying on a web developer. From my point of view, our site itself is relatively unremarkable, but we both felt it succeeds in bringing work from an analog, materially-minded community of creators into a space that's primed for how people use the internet now. Instagram was also an important part of the project's circulation. Engaging with this platform isn't without its downsides, given its dubious corporate ethics and ad-based revenue model. But the app employs experts who endlessly fine tune the interface for maximum interaction with a focus on content that's visual first and foremost. That allowed us to go where the people already were and show them what we had to share. Digital accessibility is a highly time specific and content dependent practice. So archiving the site is a priority for us. While we don't know exactly what it will look like in 20 years or how usable it will be, we can take some specific future-proofing measures now. 
We know that the project has outgrown Squarespace, so we're working with a developer on a rebuild that allows the entire site to exist as a file index. This means it's stored safely and can be used even without the internet. It won't result in any noticeable visual changes, but it also frees us from a subscription service with its own uncertain future. But that archiving only accounts for QPL's digital vestiges, which raised a larger question about the success of our conceit. Did users actually print and fold the books? It appears that a niche of especially passionate users completed that imagined sequence we outlined before. But regardless of size, those numbers felt significant to us. Realistically, most library visitors have only ever seen the books on screen. The site and Instagram posts might have actually translated the success, translated the haptic qualities of the books successfully in such a way that it supplanted a user's impulse to print them out. Ironically, our books likely circulated so broadly in a digital space because presenting them as printed objects lent them a sense of cultural legitimacy. Another variable for our audience was the desktop printer. Described aptly by QPL artist and printer testing co-founder Amzi Emmons as, quote, magic technology made into ubiquitous and invisible trash by weird pricing schemes. Neither of us printed every book as the project developed. We felt both beholden to the idea of the printer as a necessary appliance and honestly a little avoidant of it in practice. It's true that a user who printed our books had the benefit of physical experience at a time when physical touch was perhaps what we missed most. But for the many users who have no printer or whose firmware is out of date, who don't want to buy ink or just don't want to make the effort, we were pleased that the digital translation still provided them with an adequate sense of the experience. Ultimately, the project did circulate most rapidly and extensively on social media and would likely not have reached a significant general audience in any previous era of the internet. While virality is not a new digital concept, it seems apt that a project born of social distancing could spread from friend to friend as if contagious. When we launched on July 15th, 2020, COVID-19 cases and infection rates were higher than ever before. Our project was sadly more relevant than we'd hoped it might be. The first, the first day gave us a special window into what it felt like, what felt like a sacred phenomenon. It was possible to see that visitors from different countries were printing and folding the same book on or around the same time, creating alone, but in tandem. This separate simultaneity reflected the potential that a digitally native project intended for material realization might achieve, a way of puncturing the digital realm to create a shared haptic art experience in a time of isolation. Since then, QPL has garnered 130,000 page views, attracted visitors from more than 100 countries, and raised over $2,000. This reach was generated largely by the audience that each contributing artist brought to the site and accelerated by several exciting mentions in the media, perhaps most notably a feature on the Daily Heller. This digital circulation was a pleasant surprise, but we were even more taken aback when QPL began to manifest in the physical world. The project is represented on WorldCat, as a handful of libraries have included the library in their digital collections, but at least one has amassed a printed set too. Several library contributors eventually facilitated public book displays. James Sturm supported librarians at the Center for Cartoon Studies who created an exhibit. And another artist, Lynn Avedinka, who folded what was then every book in the collection to feature at the Power of the Press Fest in Detroit. 
we were stunned by this display and the photos that Lynn shared with us. As the initial promise of vaccination facilitated our collective emergence, audiences began to find QPL through books they encountered in space rather than vice versa. We received beautiful images from these events, visitors holding books carefully in their hands, happy to be experiencing something new and intimate. In October of 2021, we led an in-person workshop at the Las Vegas Book Festival. These interactions completed a cycle we'd not imagined or anticipated. And these new connections meant we received messages from visitors all over the world, like someone who wrote to let us know he'd printed out his favorite books to give away at a bike park he helps run in the Bronx. Many visitors were excited to tell us they'd been using the library as a resource for remote instruction. Knowing these books would reach so many students was satisfying, and it was a boon to hear that QPL may have eased even the slightest burden for overworked educators. These pen pals joined the contributing artists with whom we had been happily corresponding, many of whom had also been perfect strangers. We compared bird sightings from Wisconsin to Israel, traded lockdown stories, and heard about loved ones who'd been ill. As we continued to publish books in bi-monthly installments, our inboxes were replete with gifts, newly submitted books, curious artists, and thoughtful visitors. QPL began as a way to connect with others around a shared experience. We used a form we loved, artist books, to reach people where they were, anywhere but mostly at home. The conceit of a library reflected our personal values and framed our intentions to freely offer something we cared about. The success of the project was dependent on how the work was created, shared, and received. Generosity from myriad contributors built the collection. We strove to thoughtfully publish and circulate its works. And strangers across the world enjoyed these novel little books as the gifts we envisioned them to be. From artists' passionate participation to the extent of the project's digital circulation, we feel we achieved our goals. We also identified areas for growth. We worked to understand our positions as class secure, educated white women and considered what it meant to give something to everybody. Had we accounted for the unintended consequences that came with our idea or did we fail to anticipate its risks? Did the project's curation function as gatekeeping, just representing our own personal tastes and promoting our own communities? Or did we stretch to reach beyond what we knew or thought familiar? The answer is a little bit of all of these. We learned as we went, we changed our minds, asked for feedback, and pivoted as we felt appropriate. We questioned and encouraged one another, and we still do. Our clearest insight is that giving yourself permission to do something you imagine will be good is the only authority you need. We're both well aware of the baggage that comes with the medium of book arts and all its unspoken expectations. Trying to make something that resembles something else you love can be limiting. Our devotion to materials, tradition, craftsmanship, and pride in these things can sometimes keep us from exploring new things with different potentials. It, it was the extenuating circumstances of the pandemic that allowed us to see the possibilities and legitimacy of the medium in a new way that were by necessity less confined. There is a conspicuous absence of material investigation in this space, yet it's not less successful as book arts for that being true. Having brushed up against this latitude, we're hungry for others to continue exploring it too. The question of when and how we might end the project was one we returned to again and again. The project was of its time and its generation depended on ever-changing conditions in the outside world as well as the circumstances of our own lives. There was no right time. We decided in the summer of 2021, before the Omicron variant emerged, when life on the other side of the pandemic appeared to be within reach, that our last planned release of books would be in December, 2021. 
to acknowledge the danger and uncertainty of the ongoing global pandemic, we distinguish the final round by inviting only international artists, those outside our home base in the United States, reflecting on the reality that our fates are bound up in one another's. We are still attached to QPL and to its possibilities. We're allowing ourselves time to consider what the project might look like in the future, should we choose to revisit it. Of course, no matter when QP, COVID-19 becomes endemic, excuse me for saying that laughingly, not QPL, but C-19, our everyday life will look quite different than it did in March of 2020. Quarantine Public Library has been a way for us to understand that this altered future is one worth sharing. Thank you all so much. We're gonna turn this over to Meg Rotzel, who will lead the conversation and take audience questions. Hello, um, thank you, Tracy and Katie, for your generosity in revealing and sharing so many aspects of the QPL. Um, I've been primarily interacting with the books in the gallery and um, seeing new, um, deeper aspects of the project today is a treat. And I'm glad that you could share that with Radcliffe's audiences. And I'm really excited about how this project works relationally across many different kinds of um, many different aspects of um, the QPL. And I thank you for that. And I just want to let the audience know that you can use your um, Q&A button um, to send a question while we're having a conversation. And thank you to the folks who have sent some really engaging ones. Um, so I'm excited to get into it with you too. So um, I'm very struck by the digital and social aspects of the project, its roots in the pandemic. Um, and I'm also, thank you for giving us some peeks into the books themselves because they like they really are the star of the show, but you, you have to get to them. So I want everybody to visit the website and please uh, stop by the Radcliffe Gallery if you're in town. Um, there is a question that came in from the audience that I thought that we could discuss to get us started off. Um, so one member asked, how was accessibility integrated, both in terms of visual, font size, color, et cetera, as well for people who are blind and um, folks who are site access needs? I know I addressed this in the in exhibitions using ADA guidelines, but I'm interested to hear how that impacted your work. I can take this. That's all right, Tracy. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of our access, at least initially, our accessibility concerns had to do with like making file sizes efficient and thinking about um, how we could direct people to something in a way that was understandable and easy to navigate to. But we did think a little bit about some of those um, perhaps more fundamental visual accessibility concerns too. Um, this might relate to another question that I think came in, but um, one thing that we did was in our initial instructions to some of the artists, we just sort of gave them an overview of things that we'd like them to consider. Mm -hmm. And one of those was how successfully their book would translate to both screen and print presentation, primarily um, how their book might translate to a printer that couldn't print things particularly, like with a particularly high amount of fidelity. So we asked folks to look at their designs in black and white and like if they had a lot of sort of low contrast designs that relied specifically on color to edit that just so that contrast would always be present and present and allow people to engage. Um, we also did like I followed the minimum ADA guidelines for type contrast and size on the website. I think that's another thing that Squarespace allows you to do really well because the designs are really just built around standard best practices and on the web, the ADA um, compliance is just becoming a much more in mainstream issue, which is great. I think one thing that happened over the course of the project um, that I wish would have been an earlier integration was that in the last few months, Instagram has started, um, Instagram and Twitter have started 
integrating options for alt text in their images. Um, we already had quite lengthy descriptions to get like the, uh, the artist biography and the blurb into the caption of Instagram. Um, but I think, you know, if going forward, if you receive maybe like a grant to get some guidance on future, um, on ways to successfully convey image descriptions or perhaps some training on that, now that, especially now that those features are built into the social media environments themselves, that would be something that I would love to see happen. That is really interesting how this, this like self-publishing, I think of machine of Instagram or can be, how it is beginning to inform um, how people work with images. And I was really interested and, and I didn't know this piece about um, how ADA is, is coming into these platforms, almost teaching the users how to, or about the, about that work. And that is really fascinating to me. And, um, I was also interested to see how these work on Instagram and how you display them as well. And I'm very curious about um, that one slide you had that like since the 15th century that how these platforms of publishing um, run throughout. And I know that this, this, is, the, this is the case of um, how printed material has existed across time. And I'm curious about Tracy and Katie um, talking about Solar Buckle Press and how that, and maybe describing to our um, audience, like what that kind of printmaking is and how it kind of carries through to um, different forms that you're working with, if that's clear. I know that's a lot of questions, but I'm really interested in how one thing changes into another thing. So am I, so am I. Uh, and it, and at uh, the Silver Buckle Press uh, was at the UW-Madison Libraries for decades. And um, because it was embedded within the library, uh, there were some particular directions it took in, and I really was interested in teaching and using the collections in the library and the expertise of librarians there, I'm not a librarian, I'm very much of them, uh, to, uh, to help extend the letterpress collection. So it was a small, it's a small turn of the century, 19th to 20th century collection of letterpress equipment, hand presses, handset metal type, and some a nice collection of wood type. And it's used for demonstration purposes. So there weren't ongoing active classes, but people came for tours or I consulted with others and we published and also trained students in usually the art department, how to use materials. But I was always most interested in, because you're working with maybe freshman communication students, what's interesting about printing isn't um, ye old printer, you know, from my point of view, but it's what was current then how does it relate to what we understand today? Our collection and special collections had a beautiful, um, large uh, set of materials from this, um, these pamphlets that were like blogs that were done by teenagers, mostly young adults around the Civil War era through to the early part of the 20th century. It's a 19th century endeavor, but um, but they they look so much like blogs that were at the time I was teaching that were pretty current blogs are kind of coming back and I could show them these printed materials talk about how they'd been printed originally and they were DIY many people kids were printing them themselves and saying what was on their minds and it looks like social media so that's my interest and Katie could talk a little bit more because it is really interesting to think about the like Instagram being a publishing a place where publishing happens now and it's very clearly DIY, but what does it mean for the history of printing and is printing really a term that's um, right. germane? Right. Yeah, I think I'll just quickly say that um, I'm teaching an independent publishing course this semester and I've been surprised when I offer both digital and more tactile means of making a project. The students are very, very, very like, adamant that they don't want to use the digital thing, that they're very excited about the analog process of it. 
Um, and I introduced them to some reading about the history of uh, risographs and other spirit duplicators last week. And, you know, they were all just like sort of getting really excited about how all these things appeared in the world and kind of being like, yeah, down with digital, down with digital. Um, and I, I will just say I did ask. I was like, OK, so can I ask how many of you shared on Instagram? How many of you made a post about the zines that we made a few weeks ago? And they all were reluctantly like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do think there's something cool, though, about using that to redirect people back to print. Like I, yeah. I don't think that it's a question now of mutual exclusivity. I think it's just about using that tool as a way of showing people something. And in fact, like I think, you know, the New York Art Book Fair, which was just on this last weekend, has more attendees than ever, like kind of exponentially every year now. Um, this yeah. year's being particularly large and going on for like five days. Um, it's interesting that you're talking about that because um, in the experience of these books in the gallery, um, like I, when I do a tour, I talk about like comics and then I talk about these big issues, which you've covered very much so in this presentation and in the books, which is kind of about how um, politics and public health and the well being of the people in our country and beyond are so present. And um, so I, I talk about that, I talk about this, and I kind of realize the exhibition is sort of structured also like a library, but then it has tables, which is where people can do drawing. And it's in an educational um, sphere too. And I was hoping, like, I've noticed that in the gallery, when we get to the drawing part, folks are a little worried to start drawing, but they're curious about the folding. So the folding leads to the drawing. And for me, it's actually helped me a lot too, because I don't understand the comic form as well as I understand that this comes after this form and I can cut it up. And then I realized I could make a comic like just like that. So as teachers, as educators, what do you think about this fold first and then content after that? If that makes sense to you, this form and then content. Hmm. Who wants to take this? <laughs> Tracy, I can start a little. Um, what it makes me think of, and this might be self-serving because I'm an artist who very much functions this way, but I've had people say to me at various points that there are sort of, you know, you can think about people's approaches to creativity in two terms, either as a painter or a collagist. And a painter feels like extremely supported by and encouraged by a blank piece of paper in front of them. And um, a collagist sort of likes to have something there to respond to. Um, and so I think about that. And I also think about, um, you know, there's a cartoonist named Linda Berry, who actually, I'm not sure if she is anymore for a while. She was a guest lecturer at UW-Madison and did some really innovative comics-based programming there. Faculty. Faculty. Yes. Faculty. Um, but one thing that she always does, I think, in some of her initial classes is that when she gives students a stack of papers, she has them draw a big X through every sheet first. Um, and it's just sort of discarding this idea of preciousness. Um, and so I do think that like one thing that happens for everybody about the folding is that like you've sort of already done something to it. You've already maybe like sullied it with your own dirt in some way. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, um, it can be people who identify, you know, as less creative because they've been told that they're intelligent in other ways. They can be really hesitant to begin and sort of like self-censor yeah. to the point of paralysis. Um, and there is a way that like just getting the hands started and showing that you can successfully do something with your hands offers an opportunity for right. beginning in a way that isn't so intimidating. Right. Um, I want to say that we are close to our last um, question. I could talk forever with you two, but I also want to clarify something that I said um, a bit ago. Um, thanks for the person on the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to say that um, this person pointed out that X, alt text being integrated into Instagram, uh, Instagram is different than what I said, which was ADA being integrated on all these platforms. And I just want to say what I intended to say that is 
um, ADA very much um, forms exhibition design for me within the galleries. So at that point, covered, <laughs> thank you. And then um, we have a question, maybe this can be our last question is, how can we encourage um, ALA or the American Library Association or our public libraries to support your project moving forward? I love that so much. And I saw that uh, a former colleague also posted something and I'm, I'm not supposed to type, I might, uh, I might upset the <laughs> Apple part, but please Hello, send friends. a pull back from me. Thank you. And I loved that question. Katie probably has some ideas too, but I think if you, know a library or love a librarian and they haven't or don't already know about it just introducing it locally uh, if that's a university or a public library is a way to spread the word it is something that really spreads through people and uh, you can look at the world cat entries and then see i mean i'm really interested in someone individually cataloging all of these as physical objects as opposed to a collection level so that's one thing i'm interested in katie Oh, I, it just makes me think of actually a presentation that I just saw at a print conference this weekend um, where they were discussing alternative histories, particularly Chicano print, and um, the presentation by the scholar Claudia Zapata, um, she just said, you know, they just said, um, libraries are our best forms of collection for things that aren't, um, for things that museums don't know that they're supposed to value. Um, so. I think just the idea that any library might be looking at this and paying attention to it or paying to other ephemeral forms um, is always a good thing to strive for in those spaces. And, and it's both, it's several, it's special collections um, at RIT, mm -hmm. uh, the Cary collection, and then another, there was another in St. Louis, I think. So it's often special collections that uh, realize they could pick this up and we also had a school where it was being used and they wanted to make it an offering on their um, digital platform for students to have access to. So. so I guess that that is a call to action for um, folks here. Um, and I wanna thank you both Katie and Tracy. Um, it has been such a pleasure to meet you through this project and I hope that um, we can work together in the future. And um, I guess I'll go on to say that this concludes our program today. And again, I'm just gonna thank you for your thoughtful conversation and also our audience for um, some terrific questions. And I also wanted to let you know that registration to visit Drawing Us Together Public Life and Public Health and Contemporary Comics can be accessed at our Radcliffe website, radcliffe.harvard.edu. And the exhibition is free and open to the public through December 17th, Mondays through Saturday, noon to five. And since the health and safety of our visitors and staff are our primary concern, advanced registration is definitely encouraged before you visit us. And um, finally, today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website. So you can send this to your library colleagues um, about an, and it'll appear in about a week. And for Im uh, information about upcoming Radcliffe virtual programs and to see videos of past events, please visit us again at our website where you will also find registration for the upcoming in-person workshops featuring cartoonist Dan Knott and Cara Bean. So thanks again for joining us today and take care.